Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. I'm Nick Bodmer, and technically, it's our week off. That is true, but we had such a surplus of audience questions, and we wanted to say hi to you at least quickly this week. So we'll answer these questions about 10-bit video and distributing your indie film. And then we'll see you for a regular length episode next week, July 12th. All right, here's an email from Dan, who starts off his email, Good day, Griffin and Nick. He's from Australia. Australian, mate. And he has the GH5, he loves the podcast, and he was curious about the 10-bit color on the GH5. And he's just wondering, now that Adobe and Premiere Pro can support it, he's wondering, do I need to shoot 10-bit if I don't even have a monitor that can play 10-bit video? Well, I guess the question is, how much visual effects and color correcting are you doing? If the answer is a lot, I would say yes. If the answer is not much, I would say no. I mean, it points out there's, I think there's a lot of confusion in the marketplace about why you shoot with 10-bit. It's an exciting thing for Panasonic to be able to say that they have 10-bit color in this camera. But as he points out, he has a new, he has the Touch Bar MacBook Pro. Nice. And is he correct in saying that it only has an 8-bit screen? I believe that's correct, yeah. I imagine he is, yeah, because everything, almost everything is an 8-bit screen. I'm looking at 8-bit screens right now. My TV's probably an 8-bit screen. Yeah. You can't even see 10-bit on most screens. But, again, that's not the whole point of shooting 10-bit. There's more data for the color in 10-bit, and that means when you push it or adjust it or do whatever you're going to do, it has more precision to work with, and it's going to eliminate banding if you have to push it quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think your human eyes can tell the difference, but once you're doing some real color work, you may need it. So yeah, you, don't don't shoot with it unless you think you have a project that needs it or a colorist involved. You know, Griffin, I might have run into some banding. Tell me if this makes sense or if it was just an artifact of me not working at full resolution or something. So I was working on a, a wedding film. Uh, I actually had a shot at the very end. It was kind of a dramatic silhouette shot against a, you know, uh, a sunset sky with a couple up on top of a hill. It was very pretty. But I was just pushing the colors, adjusting the shadows a little bit, things like that. Um, and it looked great. I didn't see any banding until I did a fade to black. And during the fade, yes. all of a sudden, now I'm starting to see banding. That hey, what am I? What am I seeing there? Yeah, I've I've seen that too. I think. You're, I mean, a fade to black is essentially asking asking the computer to, like, expose down. You're almost doing, like, a color correction uh, as, you're, as you're fading to black. So, yeah, that, that can happen. So do you, is that a situation where 10-bit would have helped me? I would think so, yeah. I mean, I, I, especially I see people talking about getting that banding, especially in skies is where you really notice it. And, this, yeah, it was in a sky. That's exactly yeah. where it was, yep. Yeah. Interesting. That's why I like cuts. Just cut to black. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This this was a very emotional moment. We're going to stick with the banding. It looked nice. Yeah. And as much as like people like us notice banding, I don't think your client will ever notice it or most audiences will notice it. I mean, I I think it's important to recognize these things and see figure out how we can avoid them, but at the same time, I think it's healthy to just recognize that your average audience member will never see these things yeah i was still very happy with my shots (laughs) yeah don't get too hung up very i don't get very many good shots and this one i was pretty (laughs) proud of so i should send you a link so you can watch this one and see the end yeah the rest of the video yeah it's not that great but this one the end the last shot is okay (laughs) cool well there's a there's a thing we learned in um when i got my i studied communication in school and uh one of the things we learn is the primacy recency effect the idea that people only remember the first and last parts of something they experience beautiful like a speech you remember the intro and the conclusion so yeah just have your first shot of every video and your last shot of every video look great and you're good first shot wasn't that great (laughs) (laughs) there's are there's a couple good shots spread out in this video but some of them are not not as good yeah but it's classic gh2 footage man looking good gh2 is a great camera yep Here's a uh, Facebook message we got from Steve, and he's just wondering about the process of getting documentary films on services like iTunes, Amazon, Netflix, and places to get money from it. And what I like is that he actually, I guess he was just at VidCon last week. Oh, cool. And someone was talking about that it's time for filmmakers to stop 
treating themselves so terribly and putting their stuff on free platforms like YouTube or platforms that don't pay you very much like ad supported YouTube and you know put them on real places like you know to sell them like Amazon and and iTunes but he just doesn't know how to do it he knows that Sriracha is in many of those places how'd you do it well we did a whole episode on this (laughs) right you've told me like a thousand times I remember (laughs) So if you are uh, looking to listen to a full episode this week, you should go check out episode eight of our podcast where I talk about where I've sold Sriracha. But just to answer briefly, um, it is on iTunes and it is on Amazon. I'm actually not on Netflix, but iTunes and Amazon, I used a aggregator company uh, called Premier Digital. I just went to Premier Digital. I paid them $500 one time. They put it on both platforms and now I make the revenue after Amazon and iTunes takes their cut, but this aggregator company doesn't take any more money from me. It was just a one-time thing. Are they still a middleman, or does do the payments go straight to you now from Amazon and iTunes? Uh, they are still a middleman. They still control the payments. Gotcha. Yeah. So I suppose if they were lying to me about the payments, but they're, <laughs> I, they're not. I, I trust them. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. And of course, as he mentioned, he mentions Vimeo as well. I'm also on Vimeo. That's another place you can you can actually do Vimeo yourself. In fact, you premiered on Vimeo, did you not? I did. Yeah. Very good. And this also relates to an email we got from Austin, who is also asking about self distribution. He did a Kickstarter for a documentary a while back, and he's been promising people a digital copy where they can watch and download the film. And he's just wondering what's a good place to do that. Well, let... Vim- Vimeo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like we yeah. just said, I think Vimeo works pretty well, and Vimeo allows them to do the downloads as well, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Vimeo, handy. I use Vimeo on demand, which you pay two hundred dollars annually to have Vimeo Pro, and then you have the Vimeo on demand features. But even before I did that, just for my Kickstarter backers, before I was even selling it to the public, just for Kickstarter backers, I think I just did a regular Vimeo like not unlisted i think like private video or something like with like. A, a password protected right yeah yeah that that's what i love about vimeo is that there's all those options for privacy yep that's great but even in a private video you could set download and, and deliver hey, it that I way st- i still have the kickstarter version of the film i need to get like the latest cut from you yeah that's what's funny is there is a there are several vimeo versions there's like the vimeo for kickstarter which I don't think I ever updated. So if if you're a Kickstarter backer, you could still go back and watch like version 1.0, which is in effect the same movie. But I did make like four small changes later. <laughs> so that it's not a dramatic change? Runtime no, it's is the things same. like there was a shot that I stabilized that I thought could look a little bit better if it was warp stabilized. And... I can't remember if I had yet added motion blur to the credits. Yeah, just I think little you things did. like that. I think yeah. you did. It was just so small little things. Do you still have the Sriracha Final Cut project? Like you have it so you could fire it up in any moment and do whatever you need to it? I do, yeah. And occasionally I've opened it up to pull out some edits to teach some things. Or I think at one point I had to export like a version of the film. It's something. It was something for... Like to get to make a dubbed version, I think I had to go in and like take all the the voices out or something. something oh, weird interesting. Like yeah, because they would need they would want all the music and sound effects exactly where they are, but not the vocal yeah. tracks. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It makes sense. Well, that's kind of cool. Yeah. Well, this was a fun bonus episode. Yeah, short, but uh, we'll let you all get on your way, and we'll be back uh, next week, July twelfth, with a regular full episode again. Awesome. Well, thanks, Griffin. Nice talking yeah. to you. Talk to you later. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye. I need to learn to read the questions before I start reading them out loud. <laughs> <laughs> I know you noticed that one. <laughs> no, you did. You did great on that one.